It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Kim Wright, DMD, MAGD. She's a 1989 graduate from Oregon Health Science University in Portland, Oregon. She was born and raised in Alaska. At age 21, she decided she better go to college and not sure what she wanted to do, but knew what she did not want to do. And she set off in a path that landed her in dentistry. In 89, she graduated with honors from Oregon Health Science University and joined a practice in a small community 30 miles outside of Portland. After 11 years, her and her husband decided to move into Portland. She sold her practice in 2000 and built a practice in West Lynn, Oregon. Early 2001, she opened her doors as a cold start and has grown a thriving practice that provides excellent care one patient at a time. Her roots educationally are at the Panky Institute, where in the late 90s, she went through the continuum. Panky has given her a foundation providing excellent care to her patients. She has been involved in organized dentistry her entire career, and what she is most passionate about is education, bringing great speakers, topics, and innovation to Portland to share with her colleagues. The past 18 months, she has immersed in helping form the Oregon AGD Foundation, which has built the Oregon AGD Foundation Center, which service meets education. She is known as a lifelong learner and continued education junkie, taking more than 100 hours of CE annually. She earned the prestigious Master's Award from the Academy of General Dentistry in 2011. She has actively served professional associations and leadership roles, such as the past president of the Oregon AGD, past trustee for the Oregon Dental Association. She is currently the incoming chair of the Oregon Dental Association Leadership Development Committees and the AGD National Pace Council. She's a member of, uh, my God, you're, uh, you're a member of everything. Dr. Wright shares her office location with her husband, Noel, a private practice physical therapist. They have two daughters. Their oldest is at the University of Oregon, and their youngest is at the West Lynn. Um, together, the family enjoys traveling, cooking, eating, of course, and exploring the great outdoors. I, um, I have to tell you that I feel that you and I both agree that probably the number one variable correlating to the success of a dentist career is continued education. Absolutely. And, you know, small group education too, you know, and that's what I'm really most passionate about. And we've done a really great job in Oregon of bringing small hands-on education. And, you know, Oregon AGD just formed a foundation 18 months ago. And we, uh, tomorrow, we should get our occupancy permit for a 7,000 square foot education center. It has 12 operatories, uh, a 16 chair sim lab, and an 85 chair, you know, occupancy uh, auditorium. And we are very proud of that. Well, you should be. How how did you raise the money for that? I mean, what did that cost? Um, I I heard it was like two and a half million. Yes, yes, it's two and a half million. Um, We have raised one million forty eight thousand dollars in cash monetary and the rest has been donated by um industry adec has completely op- donated um 12 operatories one of which is a surgical suite uh patterson was invaluable in helping us get all these you know uh industry leaders to donate cavo kerr donated the imaging center um SciCam did our um, sterilization center. I mean, we have just had an outpouring of support from our community. So did you ever get to meet Joan and Ken Austin, the founders of ADEC Dental? Yes. They have been instrumental in our community here in Oregon. I mean, they have been so supportive of, of so many things. And, um, his, his, I didn't get a chance to go to his funeral. I was out of town, but it was in, um, a huge auditorium at Oregon state. So really it was impressive. Yeah. Yeah. He just died last year. Right. Um, yeah. he was, uh, I mean, he was just so amazing of a man. Um, my gosh, I, um, whenever I would, whenever we were little, we go on vacations. My dad always wanted to stop and see things made and I continue that tradition. So when I had all four of my boys in RV and we stopped by, a deck and at one end you know they brought in the pallets of leather and ball bearings and and at the other end is a dang a deck chair all built right there in a town of not even ten thousand people yeah what, it's a what it's a bigger town now but oh it's, is it uh, yeah 
what it's town? growing in the wine country. It's becoming a very popular. What town is it? Newburgh. Newburgh. Yeah, when yeah. I went there, I mean, when I went there, my, my boys were probably two, four, six, and eight, and uh, just small town. But what an amazing man! So, so they so they gave you twelve chairs for this thing, and, and um, all the bells and whistles, the best stuff, brand new stuff. So, you um, know. so you know, the difference between physicians and dentists is physicians ninety percent of them will never do a surgery. They're not even going to cut off a mole or a wart. And the dentist, it's reverse. It's 95% are just doing hands-on surgery all day. Do you think CE needs to be more hands-on as opposed to classroom auditorium? It has to be both. But what's we have always had a really strong education program here with live hands-on. And in Oregon, you can actually get a temporary license to do dentistry if you're out of state for education purposes. So like when we have a third molar extraction course, we get people from all over the country because we'll actually do some cases hands-on with an instructor over your shoulder. It's the best learning. It is absolutely the best way to learn new skills. And we kind of have a mantra here uh, in the Oregon AGD, which is build a skill a year. If a young dentist just learns one new skill or procedure that they can provide their patients every year and get really good at it. By the time you're a 30 year dentist like me, you've got a lot of tools in your, in your tool chest to help your patients. So, um, you had an interesting start. You started off, it's so funny, in Alaska. Uh, my favorite musician, Jewel, is from Alaska. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, so you said at, at age 21, you decided you better go to college. So so were you, what, were you just like salmon fishing and halibut fishing until no. 21? Or where were you at I had at a good job. I mean, I had a pretty good job for being a high school grad. You know, I just, for whatever reason, I just didn't have the desire to go to college right away. Um. And then after working for a few years, I thought, ah, I better go to college. So, you know, in in the 70s in Alaska, the drinking age was 19 and the bar stayed open until five. I'll let you guess what I was having a lot of fun. But, you know, yeah, that uh, that kind of ran its course. And I thought I better I better get my fanny to college. So where, so, where were you born in Anchorage? Anchorage, wow. Yep. God, I love it. Like the, the most exciting trip in my life, even when I tell people that are born in Alaska, they don't even believe this trip. Me, my dad, and my brother, we flew into Anchorage, drove down to Kenai and went salmon fishing, drove down to Homer, went halibut fishing, got back to um, um, Anchorage, and we still had five days. So we drove to Fairbanks, the Denali, and then drove up the pipeline road to Prudhoe Bay. <sighs> And hung out there for the night and then drove back. And when we got to the road, they said, well, you can't drive up the pipeline road. It's a private road. It's it's owned by British Petroleum. And I said, okay, but we're just going to play dumb. We're three idiots from Arizona. Are they going to arrest us and throw us in jail? And the guy said, I actually haven't seen a sheriff or a policeman on that road. I can't even remember the last time. So we drove up there because we were so dumb. We thought, we thought um, uh, Prudhoe Bay was like a city. Like Fairbanks. <laughs> no, there's not even a McDonald's there. It's a drilling town. And when we got there, they were so amazed and proud that three stupid idiots were able to drive a rental car up the pipeline access road. They put us up in the cafeteria. They fed us. They fixed them. <laughs> They were laughing so hard. I don't think they've ever seen anyone dumber in their life. That uh, is funny. There is nothing in Prudhoe Bay, I'm sure. It was, I mean, even the Arctic, we wanted to see the Arctic Ocean. That's all we want to do. And all we wow. saw was a snow field. I mean, you didn't see any water. Was, but anyway, I think Alaska is the uh, the greatest uh, state. I like to remind my uh, two boys who live in uh, Beeville, Texas, that if you cut Alexa, Alaska in half, each half would still be bigger than Texas. So do you miss Alaska? Um, and what's it like, the trade-off being uh, moving from Alaska to Oregon? You know, I don't miss Alaska. I can do everything I want to do on a vacation there. I go home every summer, almost every summer, and fish. I came home with 35 pounds of salmon this summer. Um, but I don't have to live there. So, yeah. I mean, it's dark dark winters, and yeah. So, 
it's three hours just to get to Seattle. And then you get to go on your vacation after that. So it just makes it, I, I, yeah, I like living in, in the lower 48. But would it be more lucrative if you were a dentist with $285,000 of student loans? Do they need a dentist more in Oregon or do they need a dentist more in Alaska? Probably in Alaska. Yeah. I can tell you, I have some friends that, um, worked for the Indian health service and they were out in Barrow and, and very rural, rural areas. And they learned unbelievable dentistry because there are no specialists around. You have to pretty much do everything. Um, and the need is so great in, in the native corp, in the native villages. So, um, Alaska native claim or the Alaska natives have a very strong, um, health system for their population. And so there's a lot of need. And they, and they got a strong system. Is that the, the oil money? I mean, it doesn't the oil money shed off about a thousand dollars cash per person, in Alaska. Yeah, it does. I think that has pretty much ended though. Yeah. I think last year might've been the last permanent fund dividend. Yeah. yeah. But my, my, I mean, when I go up there, I mean, I got, I'll tell you stories. I, I, maybe you can ver- verify if this is true or not. I mean, I, I was in a dentist's office. He didn't have a lock on the front door. He was up in Fairbanks and he said, man, if, it, if the, the weather's brutal and you're, you're going to freeze death and die, I don't want you to freeze death in my front door or my dental office. He didn't have a lock on his front door. Or he never locked it um, for weather permit. And he said in his, he's as old as I am. He said in his 30 years, Every five years he comes in and somebody was uh, seeking shelter in his, in his waiting room. Wow. That seems unbelievable, but yeah. in Fairbanks, it gets cold. Yeah, I mean, well, Fairbanks no, I, cold. I actually saw it. I was in his office because yeah. I'm the one. And I, I said, dude, your door doesn't have a lock on it. And, and you know, I'm, I'm looking at the door like, where the hell is the lock on this door? And he said, no. He goes, I, uh, I, don't, I don't want any lock on my door. He said, if you need to get some shelter... You, you need to get in my office. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, yeah. wow. But well, hey, if, awesome. you're, if you're single and you love the fish and hunt and everything, I mean, there, there are so many dentists up in Alaska that are booked out weeks in advance, don't take insurance, have their own fee schedule, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the difference between hope, growth, and abundance and fear and scarcity. Some people wonder if I join the AGD, will that... Um, threaten the American Dental Association. Does the Oregon AGD and the Oregon Dental Association, do they look like um, they're two guys competing with each other or are those two girls in the same pea pod and they work together? Um, how, how does that relationship work? In Oregon, we have awesome relationship with the Oregon Dental Association. As a matter of fact, the Oregon Dental Association is supporting our center. We are collaborating with the Dental Foundation of Oregon to do charity care there coming up. We have a collaborative group that's working on um, manpower issues in that we we would like to start a dental assisting school. So we have people from the ODA and people from the AGD coming together um, to see what we can do to help train more staff, which is all of our problems. I mean, it's a a tough, tough... uh, economic and employment times now for at least the dentist, not for the, not for the dental assistant and auxiliaries, but we just have a shortage of auxiliaries like everywhere else. And we're trying to solve that problem together. Um, I don't want to, I, I know it's no big deal when a guy says uh, how old he is. I, I know girls don't dig it. Let, let's just say that we're, we're near the same age, right? That's right. We're, we're near <laughs> the same age. And, and if I, if I was a girl, it's, it's like, I, when, when my sisters complain about like their stretch marks from having babies, I said, do you, do you realize if dad's got stretch marks, we'd have to show them to everyone. I mean, <laughs> when's the last time a man didn't show you his one scar? Uh, but um, is, a lot of people our age are burned out and fried and they just, my God, they want to win the lottery. They can't wait till they're 65. How come you still love dentistry in your 50s and some of your colleagues are burned out and never want to see a patient again. Yeah. I think it has to do with just being um, excited every day to learn something new. I mean, I just spent the weekend in L.A. at a symposium. It was awesome. Um, what were you doing in lower Arkansas? <laughs> L.A. Um, I went to the uh, restorative symposium there. 
it used to be put on by USC, but USC is changing their CE. And so Abdi Samini uh, put it on himself. And it was a two-day symposium. It was awesome. And uh, LA Symposium, Restorative Symposium. It was great. It keeps me inspired. Um, I think that's the thing is, uh, so I am chair of the wellness uh, initiative for the Oregon Dental Association right now. And and I'm also uh, kind of a liaison with the AGD and the Board of Dentistry in Oregon, where when people need mentoring, clinical mentoring, um, and the board deems that they need clinical mentoring, uh, we find them mentors. And the common thing that we see with people that are struggling, either you know, emotionally, financially, or with the board of dentistry, is that they become disconnected with their colleagues um, and isolation. So I think that's the key is keeping involved and um, keeping that contact with real people um, and having colleagues to collaborate with when you have a tough case or something didn't go right. You know, not everything goes right every single day in our office. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I think has helped me and I see the difference, you know, in other people that are connected. So you're saying that most of it for you, um, was learning new things. Um, and it it sounded like relationships in the dental community. Um, so it sounds like a lot of your explanation had to do with relationships. So CE and relationships are are those two things kind of together? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, some of my best friends I've met, you know, through continuing education and taking classes together. And we have a lot of classes here that will be, you know, study club type. So you meet time and time again, and you get to know these people. I'm uh, currently the director of our master track program here. And, um, and that's another great group, um, that just are there to help each other. Okay, and explain what explain run. what the master track is in case someone doesn't know. So to get your explain to get your FAGD versus your MAGD and what is a master track program. So the fellowship in the AGD, uh, you pass an exam, and you have to be a member for three years and have five hundred hours of continuing education. So if you've been a member for AGD for three years, you pass the exam and you have five hundred hours, you can apply to get your fellowship. Once you have your fellowship, um, the next educational um, award that's given at the AGD is the master's. And that takes um, 400 hours of hands-on education. So what the master track programs do around the country is um, organize and help it help members find those hands-on uh, classes readily. And it's in Oregon, um, we meet four times a year and in three years, you'll have those 400 hours. Now you need a total of 1100 hours to get your master's, but the hands-on ones are the the most difficult to find. So, um, that's what a master track program does. And some are three years, some are four years, some are five years. Every state, every constituent does their master track a little bit different but what you'll be guaranteed to get is those hands-on hours. I, I wish the AGD would do one thing for me. Um, um, when, you know, I've, I've had a magazine since 1994 and we had, we ran an article way back in the day before it was all digital where they uh, showed that the average MAGD dentist collected and netted. It was something like 20% more than the average non uh, MAGD dentist. And it's so obvious. I mean, everybody in town that I've known, I, I learned, first thing I learned is I noticed all the AGD, FAGD, MAGD, those were all the guys in Phoenix. Every time you took a CE class, it was the same 200 guys. They all had the best offices. They all loved it. They all had the fanciest toys. It was just a group of people that were into it. And so I, I set out my track to get FAGD, MAGD. And 30 years later, 
Um, those guys were the happiest, so they were the most successful. They were the most successful in happiness, money, income, toys. They, they just loved dentistry. And the ones that thought in fear and scarcity and that you never saw and you never shook their hand. I mean, they're, they're, there's den- everybody knows a dentist who lived up the street from them. They haven't even physically seen the guy one time in 10 years. And a lot of times those guys are suffering from uh, introvert, loneliness, depression, <laughs> Um, it's, it's hard to fall off the wagon in a group practice. Cause you got three other dentists in the building saying, Hey dude, you're, you've been drinking. Um, but you can, in a solo practice with a bunch of, um, enabling employees, you, you, and you, you can get really lost in the force. So I, I learned right out of the gate, you, you want to be in group practice and you want to get your MAGD. I mean that to me, um, but your solo practice, right? So, so it seems like you're the most social queen of Oregon. I mean, you're in all the social committee. So is that kind of your compensation for practicing alone? Do you think if you were in a group practice with, with three other girls born in Alaska that you wouldn't be involved in all these committees? I don't know. Maybe, but maybe not. It's hard to say. I just hired an associate this summer. So it's kind of a new. Is it your first? My first. Wow. Congratulations. Yep. And did, so, you, did you stick with the same demographic? Did you say, okay, I'm a girl. I'm going to get a girl. Half of America is afraid of the dentist. That's going to be part of our brand. Or did you just look for a dentist and it happened to be a boy or a girl? You know, I, I kind of put the word out there and I talked to several people. Um, there was a kid uh, from Oklahoma. He was from Oregon, but he went to school in Oklahoma and we talked, but then I never heard back from him again. But this gal is, is a little bit like me. Uh, you know, she went to dental school a little bit later, um, just graduated a year ago, did a residency at the VA, which you get a lot of great experience at the VA. And so she, what VA is for the international kids, the veterans administration. So she's doing dentistry on veterans within the veterans administration. Yeah. Um, so she, you know, she's really learned a lot about treating complex medical uh, patients with complex medical problems, um, and just a lot of need for dentistry. So she's probably a little bit more experienced than the average, you know, uh, student graduating, just because she was a hygienist for six years prior to going oh, to dental cool. school. Oh, cool! So yeah, yeah. So I'm getting ready to build a new office. So I thought I'd better hire an associate because I'm super busy and uh, want somebody to help me fill that new office of mine. So do you, what, what do you mean new office? You just I'm, built. I'm getting ready to build a new office. No way. Okay. Now you have I to know. tell. Now, yeah, now you have to say your age. Well, I'll be 60 very soon. So, so talk to us. How, why, how does a 60 year old build a new office? Are you talking about land and building? Or are you talking about rent, uh, re- no, land, and, land and building? I know I have asked myself that question a hundred times over the last six <laughs> months. Is this the right time in my career to do this? But, um, you know, I, I probably won't practice more than 10 years. I would, I would guess I'll be retired by the time I'm 70. It seems weird to think that I would even work till 70, but, um, yeah, so I have asked myself that question, but the situation I'm in um, with my lease and my space, I don't have enough room, and and I can't really grow, and I'm not ready to quit. So, so you bought I land, do- and you and you're gonna build a building from scratch. Yes. How how big? How many ops? Um, I think I will do six to eight. So I'm gonna build about a six thousand square foot building. My husband is a physical therapist, and we will split that building. So we'll each have about 3,000 square feet. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> wow. You know what you ought to do is you just got to go steal that new uh, AGD building they just built in Oregon. That's, I know. That's 7,000 <laughs> square feet. It really have, is awesome. Have you thought about just stealing that building? Yeah. If it was closer, I might do that. You might do that? Huh. Yeah. That, is, that is so cool that you're you're still going for it. I always, I always sit there and I, I try to think of the millions of dollars, like, like you'll, you'll see a 50 year old guy and he says, I, I, I just want to retire. I'm like, well, dude, if you fix that and you work till 70, I always tell people like, like how, like if you ask a dentist, how much money would you really like to have if you completely retired? How, how much income? And let's just say for simple math, he says, I need a hundred thousand dollars a year. 
Well, then take $100,000, divide it by a 30-year bond, and the bonds are trading at about 2.5%, but let's just say they, they traded at 5%, which they don't. Well, you would need one, you would need $2 million of bonds paying 5% to make $100,000 a year. So it's priceless to figure out why you hate dentistry and why you want to quit. And, and as you get older, what I've noticed, not that I'm getting old or anything, but I've noticed the people that are like a couple of hours older than me, um, they, by the time they get to 60, 70, they might start losing the surgical skill to do bone grafts and place implants and do molar endo, but they don't lose the skill to do the bloodless stuff like ortho, bleaching, right. bonding, fillings, uh, right. uh, and, and the smart dentistry. The what? Bread and butter dentistry. Yeah, bread and butter dentistry. And then the the ones that are crushing it the most is they, they learn the patient deal. So they'll sit there and do all the hygiene exams and new patient exams so they can communicate, diagnose, treatment plan. And then they got junior back there, five years out of school, placing all the implants and doing all the major dentistry and all that stuff. And that guy back there doing all those crazy cases could never present, sell, and close the case. I mean, the day... So I, I want to go next on that. So... um. I am going to go back to Ken and Joan Austin because I really do think they were probably the most legendary dentist. And uh, I mean, I know he's not a dentist, but he's the most legendary man in dentistry in Oregon. Mm -hmm. he, he's the Pierre Fichard GV Black of Oregon dentistry. And he, um, his hobby was restoring cars. Right. And he had about 30, 40 cars and he took half a day showing all my boys the cars and tell them all that. Um, but, um, where was I going with that? Um, oh, but in America, the average American buys 13 cars in their lifetime, brand spake and new, median price 33500 and 95% of the dentists in Oregon will never sell one case for the price of a car. We're not talking about the cars Ken restored, priceless car. They, they won't sell one car in their entire life. So isn't it kind of weird that... Ken and Joan Austin are paying for this center and he liked to restore cars and 95% of the people that take an, a hands-on CE course not, will never do one full mouth rehab in their whole life. Where is that disconnect? Well, that's interesting. So I loved, I love your analogy and I have used it many times in my practice and I have sold a lot of cars <laughs> over the years, you know, and I, it's funny because I just had a couple I had her bring her husband in because she said, oh, you know, I don't know if my husband's going to buy this. I said, bring him in. And we sat down and talked about the problems and showed what the solutions are. And we talked, We I used your absolute analogy about the cars. And he's like, okay, let's buy a car, you know. But it's about relationship. It's about trust. It's about doing the right thing all the time. Um. And when people really understand it, you know, and have a desire, then they'll do it. But it is interesting. And that's one of the things that we love to do at, you know, with our education is to give people those skills and the confidence. I was just talking to a young dentist over the weekend at this conference I was at. And she's like, I just can't sell it like that. And I said, but if you do it enough and you just keep you know, find that patient that can't afford to do this thing and do it for them at a deal. Give them a good price and, and you will gain confidence from that. And then the next time you have that same situation, you'll have the confidence to say it because patients do pick up on the fact if you don't have confidence, you know, in what you're doing and what you're proposing as treatment. There is this old fat grandpa who needs a walker to walk and he prefers his little electric car thing and whenever i would see him at safeway grocery store i'd always go to him and say hey what was more fun buying your last new car or getting your teeth fixed and he it takes him two minutes to get out of his electric deal stand up give me a bear hug that just about breaks my back the, that girl that you had to bring her husband back was she was she excited about her new car or did she wish she would have had a, a must, a new Ford Mustang instead when no, you were she all wants done? Her, she wants her new teeth. She wants her new car. You know, that's yeah. her car. Yeah. So yeah, he, you know, and, and it just, 
took her husband being there. She wanted it. She just didn't think her husband was going to buy into it, you know. But when we sat down and had that conversation, you know, you're going to buy a bunch of new cars and she's still going to have her teeth, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's it's a powerful analogy and I've used it a lot of times. Yeah. And I love it. Hey, um, I um, a lot of a lot of people, uh, you know, if you're listening to this, if you're still in dental kindergarten, just just listen to what we're saying. A hundred hours of CE a year, and happy people get rid of all the toxic people in their lifetime. And I see you five years out of dental school doing doing a happy hour with the five guys that you hung out with at AT Steel or Midwestern, and y'all hate dentistry, and all you do is bitch and complain and moan. What I love most about the the um, MAGD and the AGD is that everybody in there loved something in dentistry. Maybe it was cosmetics, maybe it was placing implants, but. But when you hang out with five other dentists and they all five love dentistry, they're going to drag you and your horrible attitude up to where it needs to be. And if you're a motivational speaker and you hang out with five people that hate dentistry, well, it's not going to take very long and you're not going to like dentistry either. Um, do do I mean what? How would you describe the MAGD? How would you describe the AGD? To, uh, most of our viewers are under thirty. A quarter are still in dental school. How would you explain the AGD to someone who's a senior at AT Still Dental? I think the local constituents of AGD is what makes it an organization. I mean, we're a network of small communities, and I just think go to a meeting, find a meeting. You know, just sound like I'm talking about AA. But, um, you know, and just find a mentor. And that's what I tell um, younger dentists is, is just find somebody, you know, go to lunch with the guy that works down the street. You know, ask him to lunch or ask the, the, the oh, older no. dentist in your community and create that relationship because we all get patients that are unhappy with us. I mean, I'm not going to you know, connect with every single patient. But when they go down the street and they know me and that patient goes down the street and bad mouths me, it's going to be a different story because they know me. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to reach out to each other in our communities. Uh, we're not competition with each other because the more good dentistry that's presented by everyone in our community, that becomes the norm for our patients. And that's well what we said. want. Well said. The more so, good dentistry done in the community becomes the norm for the community. When everybody starts walking around with white, straight, Invisalign, bleaching, whatever, that becomes the norm. Right, right. And so, um, yeah, it is it is interesting. Um, and we, we, need, we need to not be afraid to, um, to ask our neighbors for help. Last year... I had never really met the guy across the street. He's only there a couple days a week and he has a very different practice, but he called me up one day and he said, Hey, I have done this crown on this young girl three times and I can't get it right. He, he said, would you see her? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, she's coming in in 15 minutes. Can I walk her across the street with her dad? She was a 15 year old girl. And I said, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Just bring her over, you know? And, and, you know, he's just young and inexperienced. Um, and her problem was not that difficult, but I did this case for him. He refunded the money and I just did it. And, um, it was a win-win, you know, I didn't throw him under the bus and I just helped him out because he was at a loss. He didn't know what else to do. And, you know, that's the kind of thing, I mean, they paid me to do it. It's not like they, I didn't get paid to do it. I didn't do it out of the kindness of my heart. But the whole professionalism of helping people, because sometimes you do get into your head with a patient or something, and being able to ask for help uh, in a safe manner is awesome. That's what we should be doing. And I, we've had a lot of the um, dental malpractice attorneys on the show, and they always say the same thing. You get 
spanked the hardest when you don't ask for help on a case. There's nothing wrong with making a mistake. We're all humans. We all we all make mistakes. Japanese say successful man, fall down seven times, get up eight. We all make mistakes. But dude, you, you saw it. They brought you back this mistake three times and you never said, maybe you should see an endodontist. Maybe you should see a periodontist. So um, my gosh, I um, well, all I do is I, I FaceTime. When, when I'm over my head, I yeah. FaceTime my homies and say, Hey, I'm talking to this lady. Here's a problem, and I'm, I'm sh- showing them to them, and they're they're meeting, talking. I mean, yeah, um, it, it's 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 not what you know; it's what you know and who you know. And uh, right. just get out there and start running from her. And I'd so much rather you learn um, implants from the periodontist across the street than from some guy out in in in, in Taz- Tanzania. I mean, why are you flying to Africa? to learn right. implants when you go across the street. You just started placing implants. Yes, I have a, uh, about four years ago. Yeah, and so t- tell us on your journey. What what made you decide out of nowhere that you're going to start placing implants? Um, Because I was getting cases uh, that really weren't planned restoratively driven. There's nothing worse than, I mean, I just, I, I, it's unbelievable. I just had a case where, um, a guy comes in for a second opinion. He knows a dentist friend of mine and, you know, very complicated, very complicated. Probably if I don't, I'm not doing it, his restorative case because it's just too much. I referred him to a prosthodontist, but he broke a tooth off and he went to the oral surgeon. So the oral surgeon put three implants in. He has got a complicated restorative plan that has not been planned. And, you know, it really, implants should be placed with the end in mind. And so, um, yeah, so I, I was seeing a little bit too many of those. So I thought I, I can, because if I refer to an, an oral surgeon or something to have a tooth extracted, oftentimes they come back with an implant without the patient really understanding um, the whole ramification, the financial, the time commitment. They just think they're going to come over next week and get a, a tooth put on that. And, you know, and so, um, so, that's, yeah, kind so of aggr- just, that's kind of aggressive on the oral surgeon's part to place I an know. implant without a final restoration in mind. That's right. I mean, that, that, that doesn't even sound, it, happens. it doesn't sound right though. No, it doesn't. Exactly. So I mean, you should have the final restoration in mind and designed before you place the implant. Right. Especially when it's a complicated reconstruction because placing that implant in exactly the right position is what you really, really need. I mean, I've restored a lot of implants that are compromised aesthetically because they're not quite where you really wanted them to be. Okay. So talk us through your journey. You decide you want to place implants. This is America and in America, most of the implant continuing education is sponsored by an implant company. So a lot of kids are saying on dental town and emailing me, Howard at dentaltown.com. Um, my gosh, I, I, I'm out here in the middle of Nebraska or say you're in Alabama and every, every course in Alabama is going to be put on by bio horizons, which is right there in Alabama. And some places it's strong in country. Some's no, blah, blah. So how do you, how do you um, advise if a kid said, um, how do I, how did you learn how to place implants? And I want to learn how to place implants. Uh, but where I am, um, it's all going to be bio horizon stuff. I mean, is that, is that propaganda? Should I just, you know, when I took driver's ed, I didn't, uh, have my car bought yet, but I learned how to drive a car. So, so talk about your journey because you're huge in the AGD and continued education. How did you plan your continued education, did you did you pick a, an implant system first? Did you start taking courses? Were they hands-on lecture? Tell us how you went from zero to 100 in implants. Well, I, I don't do all implants. I do the easy ones, predictable, easy stuff. So I don't do super complicated things. Um, you know, I just had done a lot of didactic, you know, education, and I'd been restoring them for a long time. I have always done a lot of surgery. So I've done my own extractions. I do grafting, uh, so soft tissue and bone. So um, it wasn't a, a super big reach. I think that you need to have really good surgical foundation, you know, for that. 
uh, to do any sort of uh, surgery. So, but um, we offer a continuum here in Oregon at the AGD, hands-on, where we bring, you know, patients and get to do them right there. So that was mainly, but I think there's a lot of good, I mean, the AAID has their maxi courses. They're excellent. Um, we have one here in Oregon. Um, you get a huge, uh, huge volume of knowledge. You know, I bought Carl Misch's book and I've read a lot of that. Um, and then I just do a variety of online CE. I mean, you can gain a lot of information and a lot of knowledge um, online and reading a textbook. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's how we used to learn. Um, so, I, they, I don't think they know what the um, AIDI and the Maxi um, course program Oh, the AAI, American Association of Implant Dentists, Implant Dentistry, AAID. Um, and the Maxi course is a 300-hour uh, curriculum. It's very... Uh, prescribed. I mean, it's, it's very comprehensive education and all maxi courses are, are really the same. I mean, they may have some nuances difference, but you're going to get 300 hours of education when you get through a maxi course. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of good places to, but that, to learn. That's where I was kind of getting at. Um, you know, you're kind of, um, you know, let's say you live in Alabama. And that's where BioHorizons made, or let, let, let's say you're in um, um, Switzerland and you're, you're right up to Sweden, you're right, right across from uh, Strawman or Noble BioCare. Um, that, that's a manufacturer driven course, but isn't this AAID, the maxi course program, isn't that kind of being the, becoming quickly the gold standard of launching a kid into implantology? Would you go that far? I mean, what, what, what? Talk more about the... Uh, well, of course, they... I mean, AAID would say that. And I think, you know, but there's the Mish Institute. I mean, there's a lot of good places to go. Um, but I think, you know, where people get in trouble, I think, is to take a two-day class, you know, and maybe place an implant, one implant or something, um, or a few implants. You go to Dominican Republic and you place a few implants. But the reality is, is that it's not placing it. It's following through. How did you, how did that ever get restored? Was it easy to restore? Did you have it in the ideal location? And you don't learn that in a weekend. I mean, it, it takes more than a weekend, in my humble opinion, to, to learn any new skill. And especially surgical and, um, and the thing of, the thing that's different about implants is the consequence of it not being done right is a little bit more, I mean, it, the, the downside is much greater if you don't get it right the first time, you know, or you, you, the, the consequences are a lot, a lot more challenging than, than uh, just doing a three unit bridge. I, I tell people if you um, if you uh, if the patient doesn't have enough money to have it done right, then you should do the implant case on it because when it fails, then you'll get to pay to have it done completely right. <laughs> so give her give her That's a true. used Chevy implant case, and then when it fails, you'll buy her a Mercedes Benz. That's true. Absolutely true. Um, yeah, I. <clears throat> implants is a serious it's a lifelong commitment it's like it, it, it's like it's like people who go to the gym and get a personal trainer okay you already paid to go to the gym and now you pay for a personal trainer to help you exercise in in your gym um those people aren't going to become professional athletes a prof professional athlete knows that and an being athletes a full-time job you got to sleep right you got to eat right it's a 20 man when you start placing implants that that that's a commitment that that's a lifestyle change it's it's going to be a nonstop diet of of CE knowledge the rest of your life. Where I um, have a trouble with um, with these young kids is they they seem to romantically want to be super dentists. They want to master endo and cosmetics and root canals and pediatric dentistry and silver diamine fluoride and Invisalign. I'm like, I, I I don't think you can do that. Um, do you, uh, I want you to talk about that. It, they, they come out of school, they're super excited. They want to master everything. 
And I don't know. I mean, I look around at the 1 million physicians and these guys only do eyes. And these guys only do retinas and eyes. And these guys only do glaucoma and eyes. And then I look at, at this young dental student and they go, well, I want to do eyes, ears, nose, throat, and teeth. And it's like, I, I, I don't know if that's going to work. So what, what, do, what do you think about the 2019 super dentist? I think, you know, I think it's important. I mean, there's a balance. I mean, your patients trust you. So a lot of patients I get, they say, well, are you going to be able to do most of my treatment? You know? I don't want to go somewhere else for everything. So I think there is a balance between doing enough and knowing your limits, you know, knowing your limits and knowing when to refer. And um, so I think it's important, but you can't learn all those skills immediately. I mean, if you think about, you know, and we do have this mantra here, it's one skill a year. Like if you really want to get good at endo, just spend a whole year and focus your education and your practice on getting better at that skill. And at the end of the year, you'll be really pretty good at it. You'll know what you want to do. You'll know what you won't don't want to do. You'll be better at case selection, which is the whole key to being a stress-free practice environment, you know. Um, and, and then move on to another skill so that by the time you're out, 10, 15 years, you really mastered the basics and mastered them very well. And then you grow from there. But it is about growing all the time. Huh. Um, so what do you, um, what would you say, um, here's the other thing I can't figure out with the, the kids the most. They, they come out of school, they, um, they're, they wait about five years to get their own office. Um, they they all change jobs every year. Now you're up there in Oregon. So th this is, um, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, when they go to these big DSOs, they only work there for a year and they don't like it and they quit. Dude, they say the same thing when they go work in any associate office and they do the same thing when they go work at Nike in your backyard. You got Nike, you got Intel, the, the Fang stocks, Facebook, Apple, um, they can only keep their programmers for a year or two. And they jump around for about five years and then they, they own their own dental office. Um, but when they come out of school, they got $285,000 student loans. They look at you as a extremely successful role model. And they say, when I grow up, I want to be like you. Um, what would you tell them to do as they walked out of school? Live within your means. Take every challenge as a learning opportunity. You know, I mean, if you can, I mean, not everything goes right every day, but learn from it and then do better next time. And just always do the right thing. I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting with being an employee dentist. So as I learned over the years, I was always the one in control of, how much I got to charge my patients. So as I was learning, I would give people a really great deal. Say, hey, will you come to my study club? I'm, I'm learning a new procedure. And this is what you need. And I'll do it for nothing. Or for whatever your insurance covers or whatever. You know, some really good thing. A good deal for them and a good deal for me. And everybody kind of likes to come to study club and and be a part of that. It's kind of exciting for the patient too. They really, they really kind of get into it. And so I always had control over that. And so I could learn new skills over the years. Um, but as an employee dentist, a lot of times you don't have that option. And so uh, they don't have as much money for CE. And with the tax law changes this last couple of years, I mean, if you're an employee dentist, unless you're really creative, you can't even write off as a business expense the CE that you pay for. So um, I think there's just more challenges for the employee dentist to grow um, early in their career and have that flexibility. So, you know, 
um, those are challenges that I'm not sure are going to get better. But it, you know, if you're if you are thinking about being an employee dentist, that might be something to think about putting in your contract. You know, having some more CE and more opportunities to learn new things, because um, that's what will make you a better dentist. It'll make you keep you excited in dentistry throughout your whole career. Hey, hey um, I can't believe um, we um, are over. Uh, we're just coming up on hour, but I want to talk to you about some some other interesting stuff. You chair the Oregon Dental Association Wellness Committee. Um, when I got out of school in '87. Many of the states, especially the redneck southern states like uh, Texas and Alabama and all that stuff, uh, some dentists got caught drinking or eating Vicodin. I mean, they 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 tarred and feathered them. And um, then it seems like it's going more towards a disease. Like in Arizona, um, you if you have an addiction issue, they, 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 as long as you raise your hand, admit it, ask for help, man, God, everybody's there, love and support. Um, if they ask you if you have a problem and you say no, and then they later find out you're stealing, you're documenting chart, you're doing all this stuff like that, the, the DEA is going to spank you um, for a long, long time. Um, what, what, what is the Wellness Committee? Um, is that about substance abuse or is that about loneliness? or? It's about more than substance abuse. It really used to be only about substance abuse. But we've gotten into um, all areas of support. I mean, what we do see is loneliness in private practice, and and it comes out in a multitude of ways. We've had a, a couple suicides last year. That's two too many. That's a couple too many. And um, so we have a huge, we are creating this safety net of ambassadors around the state um, that people can reach out to, and we can help get our colleagues help before life is, is too challenging. You know, um, self-medication is huge. I mean, most people that have a drug or alcohol addiction is potential self-medicating for another problem, stress, anxiety, depression. So um, we are trying to destigmatize reaching out for help um, and, and helping people make decisions to get help. Um, when those are, those, some people are depressed, their ability to make good decisions is really compromised. And so they can't help themselves. They can't help their patients. So we're, we're just there to try and create a better safety net to, uh, help people earlier. And we've had some great response. I mean, we've really turned it around in the last year and re redeveloped our whole uh, wellness initiative here in Oregon. And, um, and, and it's not just for members. It is for our whole profession. If, even if you're not a member of the ODA, you reach out to us, we're going to help you. And, nice. I never even thought about that minor technicality. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Our last uh, person that reached out was not a member. And, uh, so we, did you just, so did you just like pick them up and take them to a bar. <laughs> we got a happy hour. <laughs> take them to happy. If you're not a member, we'll take you to happy hour. But if you are a member, we'll we'll get you. Out. Um, and what's really weird is that some of the biggest rock star successes I've ever seen in my life in dentistry um, started hit rock bottom along the way. I mean, and they, they were like an average Joe Harry dentist, not really fired up, crashed and found their path. And just wrote it out and became everything they wanted to be. And yeah. uh, it, it's so sad that um, a bunch of dentists who know, oh, well, obviously there's something wrong with number three and it needs a root canal built and crown and number four is fine. And then when you apply that to the brain, people just don't get it. It's like, okay, well, obviously there's a men there's mental diseases, there's mental problems, there's mental issues. And there's a stigma attached to them. They don't want to get help. There's, you know, they're just, you know, it, it's, it's come a long way, but what, what advice would you give? Um, because my, the podcast I've done on this issue, a lot of um, people in substance abuse say that over 80, 85% of the people self uh, medicating have an, another mental illness issue, a mental health issue. 
And um, and then some of it's relation. It's so complicated. They're in a toxic relationship. You know, all this stuff. Like but what would what advice would you give? There's someone driving to work right now, listening to this, who um, you know poured vodka in their coffee as, as they went out the door. And um, what what would you tell? Um, is, is it is it still eighty percent alcohol and then twenty percent opioids and five percent everything else? Is it still that eighty fifteen five? I don't know. I'm not sure what the percentages are. Actually. Well, that's what my friends tell me. So I'm going to go with probably that. probably still accurate. I mean, alcohol is a socially accepted, you know, uh, way of medicating. So, and, and, uh, and overeating, overeating. Yeah, overeating. I, mean, I mean, the biggest substance abuse is, I mean, you, you go to any place and order five pounds of bar- baby back ribs and they look at you like, Fatty, are you sure you should be eating three orders? Yeah. So overeating, I think, is the biggest substance abuse. That They sell sugar on every corner of America. Fast food, sugar. So sugar is the number one drug. They say caffeine's the most abuse. So overeating and then, uh, yeah, there you go. So overeating and then you'd say alcohol would be the next major? Yeah, yeah. And I just think that... Um if you can just reach out to one person, one person. And, and I will tell you that over my career, I mean, I just met a young dentist who bought a practice in my area and we were, it just was a fluke that we ended up driving back together to our offices. He drove me back to my office after this class because our staff took my car. They got done early. And he had just bought a practice a year ago, and I asked him how it was going. And he said, I was in practice for 10 years, and I was in a group corporate practice. And now I feel so lonely and isolated, and this is really stressful. I mean, just saying that to me, you know, told me a lot. I, I hadn't met this guy before. He, he really is, he, he, he just needed somebody to talk to. And I, I just think if you feel that way, find somebody to talk to. You know, if it's a colleague, a friend, sometimes it's easier to do it to a perfect stranger almost. Um, but every ADA component has, has some sort of a wellness. You can even reach out to the ADA. Uh, reach out to somebody. Yeah, that's you know? what I love about dentists. I mean, how they all became dentists. They all figured out calculus, trig, geometry. I mean, yeah. my, my boys always told me the coolest thing about bad, dad being a dentist is that all of his friends were dentists. And they're just so impressed. I mean, I mean, my boys have a thousand stories about you walk into a dentist's home and they have a hundred books that aren't fiction. You walk into your buddy Billy's house, his dad's a plumber, and there's no, there's no library. There's no books. Or, you know, the, and, and so if you tell any dentist... They'll work the problem. If you just tell one dentist, you know, what, what's going on in your life, they're going to work the problem. Right. And um, my gosh, um, it's, uh, um, and, and then the other thing is, it's so sad is, um, again, we, so we agree. Group practice is more exciting than solo loneliness. Um, hours of CE, it's two things. It's not just what you learn. It's the people you get to meet. You, you meet people into dentistry. I can't tell you how many courses I went to. You mentioned Carl Misch. I remember going to a Carl Misch course, sitting next to a guy who was telling me all about this other thing from Ivaclare. So I came back from Pittsburgh and then was looking. And then, f- so finally I just flew back to Buffalo and just went to, uh, because I, I chased down the, the prosthodontist lab tech guy. And he says, well, if you were here, I could just show you. And I said, well, shit, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to go. Um, and, uh, my, my gosh. And, and then when you, and then you got to have relationships. So when something goes wrong, you, you got a friend and, right. uh, my gosh, uh, just, just, uh, loneliness, uh, group practice is horrible. And, and if you have, if you're drinking vodka and you're, um, and you're having a depression, whatever, well, if it was a tooth, you'd know it needed an endo. So just tell someone that your tooth needs, that your brain needs endo. Right. And, Absolutely. and you'll get a yeah. root canal and you'll, you'll feel better. And, um, it's, uh, I'm glad the stigma is being, uh, removed from it. Um, gosh, I, uh, so, um, I saved this question for the end because I, I don't even, uh, I don't even have the manhood to ask enough, but 
when um, it's because you're a woman, um, but um, you know, when I was in school, all the women said it was a man's profession. And then now you go into dental schools and it's, it's, it's half women. So I want to ask you, did you feel back in the day that it was a man's profession and you were a square peg in a round hole? Um, I've seen over the years, some people starting like women's dental journals and women's dental associations. And then I've had other women say to me, I, I, I don't look in the mirror and see a woman. I look in the mirror and see a dentist. I don't want a special woman's deal. But so my, my question is, I just threw 30 questions at you. What's it like being a woman dentist today than when you got out of school in 1989? You know, when I was in dental school, I didn't feel like, I mean, I clearly knew I was in a man's profession because there was only um, like 10 of us. 10 out of 70 um, in our class. But it didn't seem that different among young people. But I'll tell you, I got out and I, I lived in a, and I worked in a more rural area and I became a trustee for the Oregon Dental Association, you know, for our little component early, like five years out of dental school. Right. So, and that's when I felt the difference when I walked into organized dentistry in the early nineties, I mean, I was the youngest by far, only two women on the board. I mean, gray hair men who couldn't even stay awake during the whole meeting. And it frustrated me when my opinion was thought of less, but the reality is, is the decisions we made on that day were going to affect me way longer than they were going to affect these old guys who are on their way to retirement. So it's, it's really different now. I mean, you know, um, I think it makes sense to, you know, to have more women in the profession. I mean, we just have smaller hands, you know? So, um, that's, 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 you know, the physical aspect of it. But, um, you know, now I don't feel like that at all, but it's come a long ways. And, um, and I'm super happy that women can have more opportunities in this profession because it does give you a lot of flexibility in raising a family and uh, if you're a practice owner, setting your own hours, I mean, that's really important to be able to be at school with your kids on, on some special day and take off two hours. And you can't always do that as an employee. So it's a great profession. Um, I want to ask another question, which I don't feel I can answer. Um, a lot of the girls have told me in these dental schools that their main purpose is they want to be a mom and they love dentistry and they want to be a dentist, but to be the the best mom, they don't know if they should work uh, as an associateship nine to five. So at five o'clock they can just go home and do the mom thing. Or if they'd be a better mom, if they own their own practice and called all the shots at work, if someone said to you most weighted best mom, and second weighted best dentist. What 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 would be a better professional strategy to own or to be an associate if being the best mom was the most important? I think long term ownership because you can control your life and you you know, but it's a lot of money. I mean, I can't imagine coming out of school with that much debt. The one advantage that a lot of women have women dentists have is oftentimes they're married to someone that also has a career. Um, not all, I mean, most of my, uh, male colleagues, their wives don't work. Right. Um, so that is an advantage if, if you're, if you have a, a spouse that does work. Um, but you, you potentially could find an associateship that, would fulfill that also. 
but the flexibility, I mean, if I want to take two hours off, you know, I just take walk two hours out of my schedule and go down to my kid's school for the, for the morning. Um, and, and you can't always do that as an employee dentist. So it, I don't know. I think you could have it, you know, it, the right situation as an employee could work great, but I don't think that I haven't seen too many of those, uh, women dentists that are employees that have, um, all that much flexibility. So you would say, um, so you would say then that um, it's better to own to be the best mom. I think so. And I can tell you that, I mean, my, my, I have two girls, you know, and, and now that they're older, 24 and 21, they understand more um, and have, I think, learned how to balance and juggle a lot of things from seeing their mom. I think uh, you can still be a good mom, even though you're not there 24 seven for your kid. You give them the tools and the skills to succeed in life. And that doesn't mean that, that you have to be there 24 seven. But can you really say you're a good mom if your daughter ended up being a uh, duck instead of a beaver? <laughs> well, maybe only ducks, only ducks. So that is a good robbery, isn't? It? I like oh that. Oh my rape. gosh! That, that, what about, is that one of the most intense robberies in all fifty states? The ducks and the beavers? No, it's the ducks and the huskies. The ducks and the huskies. Oh yeah, we hate the fuskies. Really? Oh, that's way worse than the duck, the beavers. Oh yeah, oh yeah, is the that, ducks and the huskies. And I and I um I really thought it was an honor. I got um, when I lectured down in Oregon um this way back in the day. I got they took me on a Nike tour, and the dentist had somebody in upper management. I got the Nike pen. Where back then in the day, there was a lot of areas you can't go into unless you're wearing the pen. Do you know what mm -hmm. I'm talking about? Or uh, I've never been there, but yeah, yeah. Makes and, sense. and um, so they had this little pen. By the way, learned a lot of things on that tour. According to this dentist whose patient was in senior management, who got me this Nike pen, who took me to Beaverton, take me all these places, tell me that you can't go. He said no one even gets into upper management if they don't have the Nike swoosh. If you don't have the logo somewhere on your body, the, the promotions. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is what these guys were telling me. And, uh, but um, um, I, I love the, the Nike, the, the, the culture, the, the excellence. Um, it, it's, it's what you're doing in dentistry. I mean, you're kind of the Nike uh, of dentistry in Oregon, uh, building this uh, center, hands-on continuing education. Uh, let's get wellness. Let's get, um, let's stop loneliness. Um, I'm glad you're getting an associate. I'm glad you're a role model out there. And, um, and by the way, the largest complaint we have with Dental Town Magazine and this podcast is when we put out an issue and we have eight articles and they're all done by men, we hear from it loud and clear, and, and we've known it for years. Um, but the problem is, is that the um, the men, um, they marry stay-at-home wives that do all the family stuff so they can write articles in the daytime. But women dentists marry um, met, marry across. We, we know that women always marry across culture. So if you're a women dentist, you're not going to marry the cook at the Waffle House because he looks good in a pair of Wranglers. That was men's best idea. That was their best idea. So they 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 marry. Um, they're almost always have an economic dependent at home, and so they can write articles and magazines and lecture and all that stuff like that. And women dentists are almost always married to somebody who has a great job, and um, they split the household deals. So what would uh, and I I always tell people when I lecture in dental school, the smartest decision you can make in dental school is marry someone in your class. Would you Would you agree with that? In your dental class? Yeah. Oh, maybe. I mean, um, if, 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 if that was the case, there would only be 10 guys in our class married. <laughs> right. But, it, but in all but yeah, of my yeah. 32 year observation, that is the lowest divorce rate. 
I mean, they talk about communication, communication, communication. Yeah. You're, you're both dentists. I mean, you, you right. understand the dental thing. You understand all that thing. And, um, I mean, the different, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's complicated, but um, women marry with their brain, and let's just say men don't. And um, they, if, if men would marry smarter, if they would get in group practice, they wouldn't have the loneliness deal, and if they weren't well, it would, it would, um, it would, it would come to the surface faster. Take your, would you say 100 hours of CE is a golden number? I think at least that. I mean, oh, at that's, least. you know, that's uh, a day a month. Yeah. You know, I don't think that's too much, you know. And, and on that note, that is why I did this podcast, because I know she's in Salina, Kansas. She's not going to get all these people like you to come lecture in Salina, Kansas. And she has an hour commute down interstate and, 50 highway 54 for an hour each way. And I think, um, um, a hundred, uh, hours a year. Um, you, you said didactic's good. I, I think just turning them on to, um, four or five hours a week of free didactic conversations right. has stimulated so many kids to go this way or that way or whatever. Um, dental town put up 400 one hour online C courses. They've been viewed a million times. Yeah. A million times. Right. So I have very good friends that learned how to um, place implants just from YouTube. They would come home every night on their big screen and they'd uh, they'd uh, get a snack and a sandwich and sit in that chair and just Google implant surgery. And and after watching who knows who from, he, he said most of them were from like Russia, Poland, the Ukraine. And after an hour of watching YouTube implant surgeries every night after about a year, he finally got a kit. And now he's an implant legend. Right. Just yeah. from YouTube. Right. So any final words to the young women dentists out there? Stay passionate about what you're doing. And and uh, uh, stay connected. Educate yourself. And uh, forge forward. And one last thing on you, I don't know if you got a female associate, it doesn't sound like you got it by design. It sounds like it just ended up being a woman associate, but I yeah. have seen, I mean, we know that half of America is afraid of the dentist. Right. We know that when your baby boy falls down and he hurts himself and he starts crying, he runs all around dad and through his legs on his way to mom. I watched that with four kids. Um, women are perceived as less threatening than a man you're not you don't look like you're gonna hurt me um it looks like i um they feel more honest to ask you questions like why did i get i get a root canal why can't you just do a filling whereas the man they might not ask questions. but whenever i've seen a woman dentist get a woman associate and they keep it the brand like rose dental and it shows like two silhouettes of women and you can go to dr jane or dr jill they drop the last name stuff which i can't tell if your last name's right if you're a boy it or is. a girl uh, oh, but, exactly, but, yeah. but when you say Kim and Sherry, I know it's two girls and, but the feminine thing, I think, I, I don't know how male dentists could compete against that. They're already afraid of us and we already know hardcore numbers. Um, if the man dentist says something, the number of questions asked by the patient is drastically less than if a woman doctor says it. If a woman doctor says you're going to have to have root canal, the patient more likely to say, well, Dr. Wright, why, why do I, why can't you just fill it? But if you're a man, you're sitting there like, ah, oh, damn, I got to get a root canal. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to leave. I'm, I'm, you know, so you, you got every advantage. I mean, if, if you were a woman and your first associate's a woman, I, I'd change your name to advanced women dental arts center. Uh, I would, <laughs> I would do all the marketing and branding. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's a huge advantage. And you and I have seen in our lifetime where back in the day when we were little, all the gynecologists were male. And now they're all female and you're seeing the same thing in pediatric dentistry. I mean, every university I go to, if the pediatric dentistry program has four or six students, they're all girls and one guy. And, yeah. and, and the directors even said that to me. Uh, so um, um, I, I think it's a huge advantage to being a woman. Uh, Dr. Kim Wright, DMD, MAGD, Advanced Dental Arts Center in Westland, Oregon. Kim, it was an honor for you to come on the show today. Thank you so much for allowing me to podcast you. Well, thank you so much for having me. All right. Have a great All day. Right. Bye.